Okay, we are recording. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome to the comms workshop. Um, my name is Rick Ebel, I'm the DSO comms. Um, and today's workshop is, we're pretty much gonna talk about what we're doing in comms. And um, <clears throat> my gosh. And, and just some of the things that we're doing and what people uh, can do if they want to be part of comms and uh, things like that. So um, if everybody could mute, please. And if you have questions, there'll be a question and answer period at the end. Um, and we will only go for an hour. I don't want anybody. Actually, I think we have lunch after this. So we have a break, so we can go a little longer if you need to. Okay. Um, again, I'm Rick Ebel. I'm the DSO comms. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here today. Um, just a reminder, uh, go into chat, put your name and your member ID number in for the record. And I think, you know, comp, uh, Mute your, mute your mics. You can have your cameras on. Uh, it's nice to see who is here, but uh, if you don't, that's fine. <clears throat> I just need to get somebody to answer the door. The last class was still go going, so people just had to leave out of it. Okay. So. What class was that? Uh, leadership. Okay. Uh, Paul Saba. Paul Saba, gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> All right, for, for those who just came into the room, again, I'm Rick Ebel, DSO comms. Um, this workshop's pretty much gonna consist of uh, what, we're, what we do in comms here in uh, D11 South. Um, how people can get involved and get active in comms and um, some of the other things that we have going on. So again, mute your mics, if you would, please. We'll uh, do question and answers uh, at the end. And to uh, start off, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the vision uh, that the district has for comms uh, in 2021. Um, essentially, the district is here to support the divisions. The divisions are the ones that we would like and we want to be running the comms program in each of their divisions within the district. We are though here to support those divisions. So if there is anything a uh, division needs that district can help with, by all means, uh, contact me through uh, the appointed uh, chain of leadership, ascent, you know, through communications, and I'll see what I can do to get that done. <clears throat> uh, next up is the the org chart, leadership chart for uh, communications. It starts with me, the DSOCM. Um, and, and actually it probably, I should probably say it starts with the DDC response. And that's Chris Milano. And then it's the DSOCM, which is me. Uh, I have some ADSO CMs, uh, Gene Schultz, uh, Don Nguyen, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. Alan Carver. Uh, gosh. Um, I have at least two more. And it's horrible that I just can't remember their names. Um, uh, Don, uh, gosh. Down in Division One. Um, Don Theriol. Don Theriault, thank you very much. 
Commodore, I appreciate that. And then, then I have another uh, ADSO, uh, Richard. And Duncan. 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 I'm, uh, by the way, if you don't know, I'm horrible about remembering names. So those are my ADSOs. Um, three of my ADSOs are geographical, so they support uh, LA North. One supports LA South, and the third one supports San Diego Inland. So Alan Carver is LA North. Gene Schultz is uh, LA South. And <coughs> Don Theriault is San Diego Inland. Um, my other two ADSOs uh, support the program uh, in a couple of other ways. Next up, we have our SOCMs. These are the, uh, the communications staff officers at your division level. Um, I don't know all of them off the top of my head and uh, whatever division that you're in, you should know who that person is. If, uh, if your flotillas in your division are having an issue and their FSOCM, which is the next level down, can't help them, then they need to go to the SO. So the chain of leadership there is uh, DSO, ADSO, SO, and FSO. It goes up and down. So what does it take to be involved in our comms program? Well, in, in order to be involved, you need to be a TCO and take the TCO PQS. And That's really the start and the only way that you're going to get a call sign and be able to have a radio facility. Another thing that is suggested, but you do not have to do, is you can take OxCom. And the OxCom class is, um, it's a good class. It's, it's a, a lot of theory uh, on communications. No. They, they talk about VHF, uh, HF, uh, propagation signals, uh, antennas, things okay. like that. Um, again, it's not required, but uh, I would suggest that anybody who wants to be involved in, in the comms program, take that class. The other benefit of taking that class is that it is a requirement to get your ox op qualification. So uh, if anybody new wants to do that, uh, wants to get involved, I would suggest and recommend that. So once you do uh, your TCO PQS and you become a TCO, um, what's your next step? Well, your next step, it's, it's kind of twofold. First, you want to figure out what kind of a radio facility you want to get. And uh, you need to keep in mind that a radio facility must be Part 90 compliant. And then once you get that, you have to put that radio facility, if you want to participate in any auxiliary uh, communications, nets, or other communication programs, talking on an auxiliary frequency, uh, you have to put that radio in uh, with an offer for use and an inspection request. The only people that can do inspections in, uh, in the Coast Guard Auxiliary are TCOs and uh, members who have taken OXCOM prior to August 1st, 19, I'm sorry, 2008. And they have to be either a flotilla staff officer, an SO, uh, an ADSO, or a DSO. Not any member who's a TCO can do an inspection. Um, inspections are done through Ox Data 2, uh, although we do have a Form 7004 
at this point now, that 7004 uh, is used as a uh, guide worksheet, if you will. You put all your information down on that. Uh, as far as your radio facility goes, uh, make, model, uh, serial number, uh, location, uh, what kind of radio it is, VHF, um, those types of things. And then you get it inspected. So that information has to be entered into Ox Data 2. And some folks uh, are having some struggles with that. And we do have that process on the district's website uh, on a presentation that our DSOIS, Chris Mather, performed for us, um, gosh, about a month ago, maybe. Uh, and it's, it's pretty clear on what needs to happen and what needs uh, to be input and how the process works. So uh, getting that radio facility inspected and offered for use, uh, accepted. Now you have a radio facility that the facility has been assigned a call sign, but if you want your own personal call sign and you've completed TCO, um, the TCO PQS, or you have OXCOM prior to, like I said before, August 1st, 2008, um, you're qualified and you just, there's a new uh, call sign request form that will be out probably this next week, uh, needs to be filled out and sent in to me and uh, I will get that call sign assigned and back to the member who requests it uh, probably within a few days of getting the request. So that's, that's the process pretty much for a VHF facility. Uh, HF facilities are a little more complicated. Um, there are other requirements involved uh, have, that have to do with antennas. Um, and other information, things that you have to have with that HF facility. And after it's inspected here at our district level, then that information needs to go to national who will uh, review the inspection information and then they will assign the call sign for that new HF um, facility. If it's uh, a inspection renewal, uh, they still have to approve it. Uh, if you have any issues or questions about getting an HF facility inspected, uh, I would recommend that you contact uh, my ADSO, Gene Schultz. Uh, he also runs our HF net here in D11. With that, I know we have a lot of new people who have joined here within the last few minutes. Uh, if you haven't already done so, go into the chat and uh, list your name and your member ID number, please. Uh, so I know who is here on the workshop today. Um, okay. Let's talk a minute about uh, division nets. Um, some of you, I'm sure, remember that uh, at least down here in LALB South, we used to do the uh, D11 South uh, district net. Uh, that net has been divided up amongst the divisions. The, the divisions are now responsible for running their own nets. So the divisions that I am currently aware of that have their own nets are division one, five, six, and division seven. I know division 11 is working on their VHF net and that should be coming up very soon. Divisions four and 12, I know the Southern portions of those divisions can um, 
hit the Yankee Sierra repeater that divisions five and six use. Um, and sometimes division one uh, can also hit Yankee Sierra. And we do have a couple of folks up in division seven uh, who can hear that net uh, from five and six, but may not be able to check in on it. Divisions nine and 10 at this point in time do not have nets. Uh, there is a, uh, a process out there called Ventrilo. And John, if you wanna jump in, if I mess up Ventrilo here, by all means, you're the expert on it, not me. Um, but I believe Ventrilo requires some uh, computer equipment and some software. Uh, John, you just want to tell us really quick what that's going to involve, Ventrilo? <clears throat> sure, <clears throat> sure. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Ventrilo is a voice over internet protocol, VOIP program uh, that we use to initially, we use it to link repeaters. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we used to have a link in Phoenix so that folks in Phoenix could talk on our repeater <clears throat> and vice versa. Uh, the link in Phoenix has gone away but we still have the program operating and it allows anybody with a computer to use their uh, computer microphone and speakers to link to our Yankee Sierra repeater because I maintain a link here 24 seven. So anything that comes in over Ventrilo automatically keys the repeater and allows people to talk. Uh, we can assign a username and a password to anybody that requests one. Uh, you can request it from me or from Richard Duncan um, in the past, there were also a couple of uh, phone and tablet apps that worked with it uh, that made it really slick. You could actually talk on the repeater from anywhere in the world on your phone, but those apps are orphaned now. They're not maintained. And <clears throat> when Ventrilo did a, a software upgrade, they don't work anymore. So right now, the only way to do it is with a computer that is running Windows. The Ventrilo program is free. It doesn't cost anything. <clears throat> and there's no subscriber fees or anything that we have to pay. So it does allow people in remote areas to talk in on our Yankee Sierra repeater, which has the widest coverage of all the four repeaters. Um, and I had one other thought, but I forgot what it was. You can also check in on the nets by using Ventrilo. Oh, I remember what it was. You also, if you're in another geographic area where you have other auxiliary members that have VHF uh, facilities and are within the simplex range of you, you could set up a simplex link at your home running through your computer that would allow anybody that can reach you simplex to also use a Ventrilo account. Um, and then the third level, the highest level is where you actually set up a link to a repeat. Uh, which gets kind of involved and requires a modified uh, signal link box. But those are the three ways people are used to use Ventrilo. Right now, there are only a couple of people that use it to check in uh, once in a while, but it is available and it is a pretty neat program. And it allows people pretty much anywhere to talk on our Yankee CR repeater. Thank you, John. Um, I hope that helps everybody out. Um, like I said, I'm not a uh, a Ventrilo expert in the least. Uh, yeah, Tom. Um, I just was wondering whatever happened to the Waze or Wave program. Uh, I haven't heard much about that. Maybe John knows more about that than some of the other people. Uh, the basic answer is nothing. <laughs> we went through a period, Wave is another voice over internet protocol uh, that is run by Motorola. <clears throat> And that would also allow any phone anywhere in the world to talk over our repeaters once it's all set up. Um, we did a test where each division had a couple of days where they could practice using Wave on their phones. Uh, and all those results were sent into national. The folks in New York are the people who are in charge of that. And the last time I asked about it, they said they had all the results, they were looking at them, but it's kind of complicated because it involves negotiations with Motorola and what it's going to cost. That would have a, a cost for individual users. Uh, so they're weighing all of that and uh, there has been no information that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, uh, thank, thank you. You don't do that. 
Eric, no, uh, that people's doll like that. That's a doll bear. Felix, <laughs> can you mute your house. microphone, please? I need everybody to mute their microphones, please. Okay. Um, thank you again, John. Um, let's see. The other thing with the division nets uh, is the divisions are responsible for maintaining their repeaters. I think the divisions were maintaining the repeaters in the past anyway, uh, but now that responsibility is officially theirs. Um, uh, the two, let's talk about the HF net real quick. Um, that HF net is on Tuesday evenings. Our net coordinator there is our ADSO Gene Schultz. Um, and thank you, Gene, for taking on that responsibility. I appreciate that. Um, so if we have uh, some HF operators that are here that have not participated and would like to, contact Gene and he will be able to give you uh, more information uh, in regards to the net, the time, the frequencies, and, uh, and so on. Although I think all of our HF folks at this time uh, get communications from Gene on that. Um, okay. One of the other things was, uh, in the vision that we have in D11 South is to um, obviously not only increase the number of members that are TCO qualified, but we also want to increase the number of members who are TCO qualified to become watch standers. Now, there's a couple of different ways our members can be watch standers at a couple of different locations. Um, first off, they can do watch standing at one of our auxiliary sites, uh, and a good example is uh, radio station Newport uh, and uh, station Gracie. Um, and you can be there, you can provide um, the, uh, uh, you can, pro you can provide the, uh, Oh, I'm drawing a blank here, folks. My apologies. Um, you can provide the support for auxiliary uh, patrols, surface patrols, uh, when the Coast Guard really doesn't have a lot of time to do that because they're busy doing other things. So that's one. That's one way. Um, another way to be a watch stander is to contact the sector, uh, the sectors or the stations that are out there and uh, go on to the Coast Guard bases and be a watchstander for them, as, such as uh, LALB uh, down in San Diego and um, Station Channel Islands. All those areas need watchstanders to provide um, uh, assistance and uh, also to provide uh, the radio guard, and that was the word I was thinking of, uh, for our auxiliary folks. Uh, another good example of radio guard that we provide for our own folks on patrol is out at Lake Silverwood. I know Division 11 uh, provides their own radio guard out there because they're not going to be able to get with the active duty on that for radio guard. So Division 11 has their own equipment that they take out to the lake, nice trailer, plenty of radios, and they provide guard for their surface operations folks. Plus it's and it's always a great way uh, being watched standing on a base uh, to interact uh, with the active duty folks. 
they like having us there. Uh, it frees up their members or uh, the members of the active duty to do other things. So they like us to be there. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, staff positions, the FSO, the SO, the ADSO, and the DSO. The key thing about those staff positions is we would really like those folks to have the TCO PQS taken care of. Yes, we still, we have a few folks that are grandfathered in, but um, just a, a, a word to, to you folks, uh, there is uh, some stuff in the wind right now that that grandfather policy may go away. So that being said, if you are one of those members who are grandfathered in because you took Oxcom prior to August 1st, 2008, I would recommend that you do take the TCO PQS. Uh, there was a little hint of that happening a few weeks ago where uh, we had some staff officers have their inspection, uh, inspector rights removed in Ox Data 2. And that some folks were upset because it just happened. I contacted National. I talked with um, the, um, not the director, but um, the division chief and asked him about it. He said it was way premature. It shouldn't have happened. Uh, and he said that those rights would be reinstated very quickly. And I hope by now they have been. Uh, but he said it is a policy change that is being discussed at national in the office of the BSX. And if any change were to happen, it's probably not going to happen until next year. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, if, if it does come about, I will make sure that I give you guys uh, that information as soon as I get it. Um, let's talk a little bit about comms exercises. Um, the divisions now are responsible for doing comms exercises uh, within their divisions. I know some divisions have already done some uh, and they were Everbridge exercises. Just so everybody understands, Everbridge is not a comms program. That falls under the guise of emergency management. Um, the exercises that we've done with Everbridge this year were pretty successful. Um, although I would expect them to be because everybody knew it was gonna happen. Uh, our next Everbridge exercise, and I understand there's going to be at least one more and maybe more, uh, it's going to happen. And people aren't going to know about it. They're going to need to, re to respond. This is really going to tell us um, who's paying attention, who knows what it is, and who has taken down the information for Everbridge in regards to the phone number because the first thing that happens is we get a text. So uh, if your members don't have that information, your SO uh, CM should have it. Uh, please get that phone number passed down and have people put it in their cell phones. That way when the phone uh, gives you the notification and you can see that it's Everbridge, you can respond. We want you to respond anyway, whether or not you know it's coming. We need to know how our members are doing. Um, all exercises that take place in comms, I'll be right with you, Mark, uh, must be approved by the DSOCM. Okay. Mark, you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, when the Everbridge kicks out a its activation and notification system, um, 
you're 100 percent correct on the, the the first thing that everybody gets is a text message um the second or third thing i, I can't remember the order right this second but uh in quick order people get an email if the email was originally classified as or the computer system or the internet provider classifies that as spam it kicks it gets kicked over to that folder it needs to be gone in found and then clicked on and told it is not spam and moved back over to the regular mailbox so that it doesn't just end up over there if you miss the phone calls the text message and everything else uh, this is really important uh, if you happen to be in meetings or whatever, and you don't get that you know, that text message or the phone calls, that that email follow up is not hidden or forgotten about. That's all I had. Thank you, Mark. Um, another thing on exercises. Um, I, I know we've done an exercise already on uh, getting a communication up from San Diego up as far north as as we could. Um, hang on, there we go. And, uh, you know, that was great. It was on the repeater and uh, there was a little simplex involved. Um, but we do these exercises to know that we're prepared when an emergency arises and the Coast Guard calls upon us to provide them with uh, assistance um, or whatever they may need for us in the way of comms. Uh, the next uh, exercise I believe that's gonna take place in that is going to be a same type of moving a message forward, um, but strictly using simplex. Because folks, to be honest, when the you know what hits the fan because of a an earthquake or or something like that uh we may very well lose our repeater uh abilities capabilities and if that's the case all we have left is uh simplex and hf well we have more people with vhf than we do with hf now that's not to say that we can't get a message out uh, to the areas we need to get it to, because I know we can. Um, but we need to be doing exercises that show what our capabilities are, show that we can function without power on whatever backup power sources we may have, whether it's generator, batteries, solar panels, what have you, uh, to get our to get our mission completed? She looks like death. Hey, Glenn, can you uh, mute, please? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, with regard to uh, Everbridge, um, as far as the pass down responsibility, uh, doesn't that fall under the flotilla commander? Uh, coming from the DSO to uh, the SOs to the flotilla commander, an emergency management person. In other words, the flotilla commander should be uh, alerting the, uh, his uh, flotillas uh, of, and handling the, uh, the uh, communications from Everbridge, right? Well, since it's not a comms, uh, responsibility. Well, the I and Mark chime in on this. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, give my understanding of the Everbridge. I mean, Everbridge sends out a communication to every member, so it's right. the members' it's the members' responsibility to reply back. Now, if they don't, and we get that information to the flotilla commander, they're supposed to follow up with their members. Right. Yeah. That's let basic. us know. That's basically what I meant there. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Then, I just want to make sure I was understanding. Yeah, I just wanted to clear that up, you know, as far yes. as uh, that goes. But uh, as far as the uh, simplex uh, uh, path drill that was uh, uh, done there uh, with just the repeater, 
uh, it really wasn't simplex. There was, I think there was only uh, maybe, well, from ARN to uh, Long Beach and Huntington Beach was basically the simplex part of that drill. But uh, we need to establish a simplex system that goes purely simplex from San Diego to all the way up to San Francisco. I don't know if that's possible without HF, but yeah. Uh, and then uh, also, is there any uh, way that we can get involved? Well, I know there is a way uh, as far as RTX traffic with simplex on either the repeaters or just simplex. And RTX is digital, basically, traffic that is path, messages are passed digitally. Uh, yeah, I, I understand the RTX uh, okay. uh, process. Um, Right now, and, and I, I know RTX is a really good tool in HF uh, because sometimes voice on HF doesn't work great. Uh, and RTX with VHF, uh, I'm sure would be great, but I'm I, honestly, I don't know how many members have that capability or want to have that capability. Um, so Honestly, I haven't pushed for anything RTX under VHF right now. Something to, we can look at in the future. Uh, and honestly, there's been a, a, a lot of stuff going on in comms uh, in the first four and a half months that I ever thought were going to happen. So um, I'm pretty pleased with that. But um just so everybody knows, and I'm sure most of you do know, I'm also the chief of staff and I'm going through a 20 month ASOC class. So, and yeah, I have, I have ADSOs that uh, are here to help me and, and do some of these things. And, uh, but that's something that we can certainly look at. But right now I, I can't give any guarantees on that. Gene, I saw you chuckling. Oh, yes. Uh, there, there are a number of us who have RTX set up on our VHF to do, and it can be done either simplex or through the repeater. And uh, if someone's interested in that, you know, they can get a hold of me. Uh, I, I will throw John Olson under the bus, too. Uh, John's good <laughs> at that. And uh, so if you're interested in that, RTX is so much faster and so much more reliable than voice. And I'll just tell you from the HF perspective, uh, last Tuesday night, there were some voice people checking in. I couldn't hear, but their RTX came through 100% clear. So, and if you're passing a official message for either us or the Coast Guard, uh, the time frames are significantly different. A voice message can take anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes to get done, and an RTX anywhere from three to five minutes. Okay, Gene, thank you. Okay, uh, I, I want to let everybody know on uh, exercises when we do them. Um, if an exercise it has a plan to send people out into the field uh, on an exercise that really involves any kind of scenario, um, everybody needs to know that there is a new position uh, in the Coast Guard Auxiliary that came down from National uh, at the start of this year, and they've been uh, fine-tuning it uh, up to this point, and it's a safety officer. So with that being said, any, any exercise that we do is going to have to be reviewed for safety purposes. Okay. Let's keep in mind, we are not first responders. So an example would be if we have that great big uh, 8.0 earthquake and, you know, freeways have buckled and gas mains have broken, water mains have broken, uh, the repeater tower fell over, uh, power is out. Uh, my guess is nobody's leaving their home until they verify that 
their family is safe, their property is safe, and if not, they're dealing with those issues. Uh, and I got to be honest with you, I don't think the Coast Guard's going to call us right then and there. Um, but with that being said, uh, nobody should go out and on their own to do anything like that. You cannot uh, self-assign yourself uh, to anything like that because all you're doing is putting yourself at risk and in harm's way and nobody wants that. So safety is a big deal, folks. And uh, that's why I need to review all of those exercises before they take place. Okay, enough about that. Uh, we have about uh, 17 minutes left. Uh, that's about all I have for everybody here. It's kind of my introduction to uh, uh, comms in D11 South. Does anybody have any questions? Gene Schultz. Yes, uh, on the, the simplex on VHF, yes. just to let you know uh, some of the capabilities uh, in an exercise with Sector San Diego, San Diego. Um, I was able to make contact with the antenna on my car and a handheld at five watts from San Diego to LALB. So awesome. depending on what's in your way. So each yeah. one of the SOs throughout the, the district needs to kind of uh, get together with their comms people and create a map of who can contact who on Simplex. And then that map is something that we can use later on to develop an overall plan for yes. emergency contact. Very good point, Gene. And, uh, that's one thing each division does need to do is uh, the SO needs to get with all of the, uh, the FSOs and put together uh, an exercise where people can be at home and you do this simplex to see who can talk to who and then get that information put together and get it passed up the chain. And uh, that way we can put it together as a district and uh, see who can talk to who. That's a great point, Gene, thank you. Rick, I gotta throw a question. He mentioned a very specific thing okay. uh, there, uh, talking about handheld radios. And in that exercise, he used a handheld radio with probably a ma either a magnetic mount or a permanent mount on a vehicle. Will that ever be, in the future, be considered a mobile facility? Uh, reason being is that uh, there is a there is a lot of essence in having those handhelds because if you don't know, have multiple handhelds ownership within a flotilla, mm -hmm. and then people have the capability of going out and being mobile and, and doing that, um, it would behoove us to have those registered as mobile facilities. Well, Wayne, uh, my first radio facility was a handheld radio mounted in my car being able to be charged from my car with a uh, antenna mount. And that was my first mobile radio facility. So yes, it can be done. Okay. Good, good, good. I, I yeah, I had a standard horizon. I had a standard horizon handheld. Uh, I modified the charging base to fit in my car, connected to the charging system of my car. And it worked really, really well. Yeah, because having that capability really expands our mobile comms uh, ability yeah. to travel around and, and do that uh, for exercises and for when uh, what you definitely need, yeah. as opposed to a physical uh, uh, mobile radio mounted uh, in a vehicle, which sometimes costs a little more and not everybody wants to put uh, that uh, um, expense out right off at the beginning. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, James, I know you, you have a question. Go ahead, James. Uh, okay. Um, with regard to the simplex uh, linking between San Diego and the LALB area, uh, when I was SOCM, we had such an exercise, and uh, I took my car out to Point Loma 
at the National Park, which is the location of the uh, Rescue 21 remote fixed facility. So I parked outside the fence of that and I had a 5 8 wave antenna on the car, on the trunk, and uh, the 50 watt typical radio in the car. I was able to take the messages from sector by they use handhelds and then I relayed that message to everyone in the LA area including those on the mountains behind LA with loud and clear signal reports. So uh, the next step would be to somehow get it up to the Ventura area. Right and that that could be a challenge uh, without using the repeater of course uh, of course. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's something that we need to work on and see how we can get that accomplished. Thank you. Yes, Diane. Diane. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Sure. Um, TCO is a permanent certification, and yes. uh, we're finding that some TCOs in our division are being kicked into re-year. Do you know why that is? Or is, it, is that yeah, an issue? Yeah, I do know why. Okay. I do know why. Uh, as a TCO, uh, to maintain that qualification, you have to take uh, introduction to risk management, which is a one-time course. And right. two, they have to take uh, the risk management TCT every year. Correct. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if they haven't done either of those or they're not doing the, the risk management TCT, that's going to kick them into REYR. Okay, what about uh, the annual ops workshops if they're required for operations people? Well, for operations people, yeah, they need to do that. And if you don't take it, that'll kick you into uh, REYR. But No, I mean, TCOs are, I was told TCOs in our district have to take the ops workshops. No. Oh, okay, that's no. good to know. Uh, but that being said, I know uh, National has a TCO workshop right. that is not required yet but this year it's strongly recommended it is strongly recommended absolutely right. okay. so that workshop can be uh, done probably takes a couple of hours uh, mm -hmm. I would recommend it be done in a group you can do it online right. just like this uh, and you know the people that are there they get credit for it uh, okay. But I would imagine this, Gene. Yes, Gene. In the past, the operations workshop has been required of TCOs who uh, request orders. Okay. Okay. I I was not aware of that. I thought TCO is a TCO. Uh, no, uh, you're part of operations. You're one of the. Yeah. You know, air surface and, and yeah. radios. So the operations workshop has been required, but the TCO workshop has always been optional. Right, right. So if the TC, so what you're saying, if the TCO wants to get orders from uh, the OIA, mm -hmm. then they need to have the ops. Okay, the standard radio guard. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, they're not going to need that if they go up to, uh, say, uh, Auxiliary Radio Newport or one of the auxiliary uh, radio stations to stand guard over our own folks. That's not that's not required as far as I know. Okay. Well, our division's inland Arizona, so um, my other question I, I is... I see you, Glenn. Hang on. Yeah, oh, go ahead, Diane. My other question is, if, you, if an auxiliarist has a handheld radio... Mm -hmm. Are you were you saying earlier that that radio has to be made into a facility in order to you to talk on it? Like if you if you just take it on a patrol as a supplementary um, radio, it has to be a facility. Yeah, yeah, it should be. It should be. Here's so, here's the here. Hang on. Here's the okay. thing about that. Um, if you have a radio facility and then uh, let's say a mobile radio facility mounted in your vehicle, and then you have a handheld. And I think this is where you were going to go, John. Uh, that handheld can be grouped with that mobile radio, and it's all the same thing. 
No, I mean just a normal exhaust with a normal handheld radio that carries it around either well, to talk I, or as a supplement to a boat patrol yeah. or something. Go ahead, John. Yeah, if you're just carrying it around on a patrol and you're operating it on marine frequencies, it does not have to be a facility. Okay. If you're going to talk on auxiliary simplex and repeater frequencies, then either it has to be an addition to a facility that you already own, or it has to be a facility. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation, John. Glenn, do you have a question? Yes, yeah, sir. Thanks, Rick. <clears throat> yeah, on, I'm, uh, uh, I'm on a, a mission right now as a radio guard, and uh, a couple weeks ago, I requested uh, assignment to duty. They told me as long as I'm uh, off off the station, I'm at my own home doing it. Um, I don't need assignment to duty. However, the uh, it's Dave Vedmarker's boat that's uh, Alpha 040 is on mission right now. They've just included me in the, in the orders by name as a radio guard. And uh, so I don't need a assignment to duty for, for radio guard. Okay. I just wanted to say that. And I had a question uh, about our call sign list. The district call sign list was, yeah. has been missing for quite a while and it needs to be updated badly. So and we're in the process, we're in the process of updating that. It you need it, it, I need some time to go through that. Uh, we just went through the radio facility list. Right. Uh, and it took us a, uh, three weeks to go through that. We made yeah. phone calls to over, uh, gosh, probably about 100 members yeah. regarding radio facilities. A lot of them that haven't been reinspected in six or seven years. Yeah, yeah. So that list is getting cleaned up. Uh, our, the next chore is going to be the call sign list. Yeah. Uh, the, the latest and greatest call sign list was put together uh, by John Olson, and that's the one we're going to work off of. Okay. okay. So, John, I may get in touch with you about that if I have any questions. I do have a copy of it. The uh, uh, the process of getting a, a call sign assignment. Yeah. Uh, like for Chris Gilbert, you assigned him a temporary call sign for about five minutes, and then and then you yeah. assigned him a permanent. That that was great. You know, no problem with doing that, but. Why, uh, why couldn't we do that for everybody that, that comes along? What do you mean everybody? And well, like then uh, a couple weeks later, uh, Bob Branham requested a call sign. He got us temporary and he kind of liked that uh, November, November Quebec call sign and he wanted to keep it, but we wound up changing it to Sierra X-ray. I just, just wondered what the process was on assigning. Is, is he a TCO? Yes, sir. Okay. Both of not really, guys. not really sure why that happened that way. Okay. Uh, I I have put into place a, uh, a just a district policy with call signs that if we're going to issue a temporary, it's going to be a, a, a Zulu call sign. Okay, uh, that okay. that sounds cool. That's that's a good idea. And then once the member has completed their TCO, right then. I will reassign them uh, a permanent call sign, but okay. I, I want the Zulus reserved for those members who need the temporary call sign to go through their PQS. Okay, from 77, you got about three more people in the pipeline. You should be requesting a call sign pretty soon. Okay, uh, I will be getting out the, uh, the request for a call sign form. It's a district form. Uh, I had a Alpha lot of help 040, from, Sierra Hotel, go ahead. Had a lot of help Sierra from Don Nguyen and the other the ADSOs in putting Sierra that uh, document together. Alpha 040, Sierra Hotel, I do not have your guard. Call um, Channel Islands Coast Guard over. <laughs> we will get that document out. Uh, again, Don uh, Nguyen put a lot of time on it. And... Uh, it's it's pretty simple. It's not nothing difficult, but uh, we'll get that out. We'll get that out. Uh, let's see. There, Paul Stein. Did you have a question? Uh, I just wanted to mention, Rick, that if anyone's requesting an assignment to duty for operations, you will need to use the Phase Three 
assignments of duty form and that health assessment form on record. Right. Yeah, that I thank you for bringing that up. I know that phase three information has been out now for a few weeks. So um, yeah, if anybody needs that assignment to duty, that's, you know, that's what you got to do. Uh, let's see, uh, Mr. Counter, you have another question. Yes, sir. Um, Mary and I have call signs that were net call signs assigned in San Diego. Uh, and I'm wondering if we have to have those changed because we've moved to division 11. You wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. No, all the call signs within district 11 South, uh, should all be on the same list. Isn't that correct, John Olson? Uh, yeah, the issue is that people have is with the uh, land mobile voice call signs because oh, they're based okay. on the flotilla charter location. Yeah. And if they move from one place to another, uh, sometimes they would like it changed so that it reflects where they really are. Gotcha. No, I, I, and I'm, I'm aware of that uh, issue and Unfortunately, that's nothing that I can change. That change is gonna to have to be requested through uh, DIROCs and the OTO. They're the only ones who can go in and make a change like that. And, and sir, would I ask uh, what form do we use? Cause we're San Diego Harbor Mobile, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there is a form right now, uh, Mr. Counts. Mr. Counter, let me let me look into that and uh, get back to you. Thank you, sir. You bet. Uh, Rick, we just have been recently looking into how to make changes to the information that's in Ox Data too. Yeah. Uh, with respect to facilities, the way to make any change is to fill out a new 7004, yeah. check the change box, put your name and member number in, and only put what you want changed on the form and then send it to the D11 mailbox, the shared mailbox. And that way the folks in uh, DIROCs that see that will know that they need to go in and make that change and all the other information stays the same. You understand that Mr. Counter? Yes, sir, I do. I'll have to look up their email address and have to take care of it. Okay. Do you have any other questions on that, Mr. Counter? Feel free to give me a call. And if I don't know the answer, I'll, uh, I'll just call John. Thank you. <laughs> um, folks, it's 12 o'clock. Uh, are there, any, first, are there any more questions? Hearing none, I wanna thank everybody who attended uh, today. Uh, I hope you got some good information out of this. If anybody has any additional questions, you can email me at uh, R-E-B-E-L-C-G-O-X at gmail.com, okay? So once again, thank you uh, for being here. Everybody have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank Good you. Job.